Uh, but then uh, Melissa really encouraged uh, me, and I absolutely agree, that we mostly want this to be a conversation, mostly Q&A. So we're going to leave a lot of time. We don't have to be out of here until 8.30. So I hope there will be plenty of time for questions uh, from the audience. Actually, can, I could ask somebody at the back to mess with the lights. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Larry Kobo from Chicago 350 is a volunteer organizer and that is uh, a term of endearment and high respect from me, especially as we've been uh, researching paid, uh, paid organizers uh, funded by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, we do this out of luck. Nobody is paying us under the table, over the table, on the side, anything like this. As a volunteer organizer for Chicago 350, Larry has assisted in the recruitment, organizing, outreach, and structuring of the local 350 chapter, especially as a leader in the citywide fossil fuel divestment campaign. He has researched and written on fossil fuel divestment opposition efforts by the oil industry. His recent paper regarding the fiscal case for fossil fuel development outlines the economic viability and disruptive force of a renewable energy as further impetus for removing even lower performing fossil fuel investments from state and municipal pension funds and operational budgets. Thank you. Hi, uh, yes, my name is Larry Cole, and I'm from Chicago 350. We are an affiliate chapter of 350.org, and this I am presenting the fiscal case for divestment from fossil fuels. Um, well, basically, um, oops, that's the wrong, wrong one, but anyway, uh, close enough. Um, that is sort of where we are over the last, since the Industrial uh, Revolution, since about 1880. Um, our average planetary temperature has risen about 1 C uh, or 1.8 degree of temperature, um, which is leading to the average temperature leading to, well, climate change. Um, and like I said, it's uh, basically 1.8 or 1.8 1 degree centigrade, 1.8 degree Fahrenheit since the Industrial Revolution. Um, now, if we continue on our current trajectory of what we're doing as far as burning fossil fuels, uh, by 2036 we'll bypass 1.5 C or 2.7 Fahrenheit. Um, if we continue on the same trajectory by 2045, we will be through 2 C. Um, and what that will mean is that we're going to run up against what is known as the carbon budget. Well, what is the carbon budget? Um, it is the estimated amount of carbon that can be burned, um, and basically scientists have said that that's about a thousand gigatons. Um, and at this point, uh, well, I should say by 2011 we'd hit 515, and usually we're running through about somewhere between 30 and 35 gigatons a year. So you can do the math to see where we're at now. Um, and by again, like I said, by 20. Uh, 45, that budget will be blown through and we will bypass that 2C threshold. And what that means is basically uh, we're going to have a planet that's going to be much more hostile to life, uh, human life, and any other creatures that happen to live here at that time. Um, now, I just want to show a couple of images of climate change here. Um, this one here, kind of fuzzy, not on my computer, but that's basically. A picture that was taken a year apart from each other, and that is uh, in central Greenland. It is the Swiss Camp Climate Station, because of the screen capture taken from Inconvenient Sequel. And that, that picture was taken a year apart. Uh, so you can already see how much of the glaciers have melted on, uh, on uh, Greenland there. And here's another one, uh, basically taken a hundred years apart. It's the same glacier field at the uh, Glacier National Park. And glaciers are nice to look at to sort of see the difference between you know, what, you know, years and what has happened because of climate change. Um, and because of climate change, you're gonna see those melting glaciers. So 
you're going to see sea level rise. Most of it's going to come off of Greenland and Antarctica. But along with that, because of climate change, you're also going to get um, increased droughts, forest fires. If you notice that, what happened out west the last few years, uh, the, the west has been burning up like crazy. Uh, the forest fires have been out of control. Uh, and then also heavy precipitation and flooding in certain areas. Hurricane Harvey dropped over 50 inches in what, three or four days? Um, so, this, so climate change is being basically driven by fossil fuel industry and our fossil fuel uh, usage. Um, so what do we have to do? Well, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. Uh, it's kind of obvious. Um, so we have to keep the coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Um, and what that means is that we have to transition from those fossil fuels. And uh, what that means as well is that it's been up there. The city of Chicago has to divest now. And here's why. <laughs> what did I just do? I just hit something. Aha. <laughs> no, a computer I've never used. Uh, excuse me. Um, so, 21st century energy uh, revolution. That's where we're at right now. And where you're seeing that most happen is in power generation, in wind, solar, and in battery storage technology. Now, you have to think of this. What's so important about this is the fact that technology, all these things are technologies, they're not a fuel. The fossil fuel industry also has technology. But what they have to do is they have to also go uh, mine it, refine it, transport it, and burn it. So those are extra costs. So what's happening is because we're having this energy revolution, wind and solar are eventually going to be cheaper. As a matter of fact, uh, costs for wind and solar have fallen by 60% since 2009, and another 40% that will have those incre decreases over the next 10 years. And by 2023, they will not need sub subsidies. This is according to Morgan Stanley and by Goldman Sachs. Um, over the next 20 years, you're going to have three trillion dollars worth of investments in fossil in uh, in wind and solar. Um, and what that's going to do is all of us will be paying less, hopefully, on our energy bills. Um, and what's really wonderful about these being technologies is that by as you increase scale, you decrease costs. And so it costs less, basically, to uh, install these. And so, um, here's a nice simple chart. Uh, the blue line, or actually the red line, is the cost of uh, solar technology coming down, the cost of solar coming down. And that blue line is the number of installations that have gone up. As you see, as the price goes down, the more installations go up. Now, um, same sort of thing here with wind. The blue bars are the cost of wind. The orange line rocketing up there is the price, or is the number of installations. And as prices come down, the number of installations has gone up. Now, Lazard Investments basically has done this uh, unsubsidized, levelized cost of uh, energy generation. And basically, they found that wind, depending upon where you're at, can cost anywhere from 30 to 60 megawatts per hour. Whereas coal is going to cost you 60 to 143. Solar is 43 to 58. Natural gas is 42 to 78. So you can already see coal is already being priced out. It's just not economically viable as it once was. Um, now, that was just a battery storage technology. Uh, how do I go backwards? Backstairs. Backspace. Uh, got it. That's an energy storage technology uh, sort of drawing of what uh, battery storage is going to look like. Um, and in this 21st century uh, energy revolution, battery storage technology is going to be vital because what it will do is going to enhance wind and solar reliability. It's going to facilitate the growth of solar and wind. And basically, it will replace gas peaker plants. You know, when you have uh, demand during the summer go up for more power, 
Uh, they usually turn on gas speaker plants, but basically these battery storage technologies will start to replace us. In California, when they had this big methane leak out of one of their storage facilities for natural gas, uh, it went out. They didn't know how to fix it for a long time. They didn't know how to fix it. And so what they ended up doing is they, the governor and the state legislature and other politicians said, we can't really have that. So what they decided, they were going to install battery storage uh, facilities. And by, they, they planned to do it over a course of a year. They were able to do it in three months. And it's going to be, end up being cheaper um, than uh, uh, doing gas speaker plants. And basically, battery storage technology is going to go from $300 million to $4 billion industry over the next two to three years. And officials have found that storage is less costly, more nimble, and easier to site and permit than new natural gas speaker plants. So, the other part of this is going to be automobiles and road, roadway transport, meaning electric vehicles and automated electric vehicles. Um, if you have not, um, oh boy, off here. Uh, if you've not read Tony Seba of Stanford's presentation called Rethink X, you should, because it tells you how fast this is going to happen. He believes within the next three to ten years, you're going to see a basic uh, rapid transportation and the uh, transformation of the transport uh, system. EVs are going to be cheaper to operate and maintain. There's going to be no oil changes. One third less parts means a lot less problems. Um, and they're going to be one of the drivers. Um, and let's try this again. That's, that's a picture of Norway. Would you like to see that here? You see all those sort of electric cars plugged in? That's our future. They're ahead of everybody right now. Um, it's really kind of cool. Where is it? That's in Norway. That's Germany? Uh, well, okay, it's Germany, but it's the, the picture that I, the place where I got it said it was Norway. But what does all this mean, all these things that I've been just telling you about? Well, um, big oil's in trouble. Um, peak oil demand should hit somewhere around 20 to 20, 23. Uh, according to the Grantham Institute and uh, Morgan Stanley, um, expensive oil fields will be removed from production because the oil price is going to crash. And by 2050, EVs will make up two thirds of transport. Uh, this is a nice little chart that Bloomberg put out saying when the, uh, they think the crash is going to happen somewhere after 2023 um, is when that crash will happen of the oil prices. Coal died, and quickly. Uh, four largest coal companies lost 90% of the capitalization. Many of them have gone into bankruptcy protection. Uh, price per megawatt hour um, is uh, no longer competitive with wind and solar again. And most of these plants are 30 to 60 years old. And uh, basically, to quote Citibank analyst Ed Morse, uh, he says, no board of directors of a utility is going to sanction a new thermal coal power plant that's going to last 50 years. And the reason is because they're just not economically viable anymore. Uh, that's a chart of how much coal has died. And actually, uh, you know, I want them to, uh, if we keep pressuring with the OFF Act, which is uh, the United States get off of fossil fuels by 2035, and in the 100% campaign, I want the EIA, which is the Energy Information Agency to have to go and revisit that chart and basically have to see it die. Um, now, that's a cage match. Why do I have a picture of a cage match? Well, it's because that's where natural gas is right now. It is in a cage match for its economic life, uh, partly because of the fact that natural gas. Um, okay is basically, they call it a bridge fuel. Um, I don't think so. The reason is, it's not a bridge fuel, is because um, it's also a major emitter of greenhouse gases, being methane. And it's a, it, methane is 84% more potent than uh, most uh, greenhouse, than CO2. Uh, Morgan Stanley, 
Grantham Institute and uh, Goldman Sachs basically say wind and solar is competitive now, and by 2020 it'll be cheaper. Uh, carbon bubble and divestment. All this means is basically renewable energy will be cheaper and it'll start displacing fossil fuels. We'll have this carbon bubble basically meaning that all these assets, since 80% of all their assets the fossil fuel companies have left to stay in the ground, or we'll pass that 2C level of, uh, of temperature rise, uh, it's going to make those in-ground assets overvalued and therefore worthless. And so we have to keep them in the ground. And fossil fuel divestment means remove city investments in oil, coal, and gas. Uh, now, this, there is a moral component to this. I'm a 53-year-old man. I have a 15-year-old son. He should not have to live when he's my age in a world that I am complicit in making. Basically, he's going to live in a world that's going to be less hospitable to him and his life and his family. And I think it's incumbent upon myself to be active and be involved in this campaign to get the city of Chicago to divest in order to sort of end the fossil fuel era. But there's also the fiscal aspect of it. It's smart policy and it's smart investment to get out of fossil fuel stocks and bonds. And so the city of Chicago should divest now. It's operational budget and pension funds. This is a chart that's of what's been going on across the planet. Over six trillion worth of assets have been uh, pledged to be divested. So action you can take, you can contact your alderman. Tell them to support our fossil fuel uh, divestment resolution. Tweet the mayor and treasurer. They want to hear from you. Uh, if you want to, on our table outside, uh, I have a whole other number of, set of, number of tweets you can potentially set off if you have a Twitter account. Who has one? I'm going to count on you tweeting tonight. <laughs> and lastly, get involved. How do you do that? You can contact us. That's how you, you know, can reach us and get in, book, get in contact with us and get involved with us. Uh, we also have that same information outside on our table. So thank you all for listening. Um, and uh, enjoy the presentation. Do not uh, expect smooth transitions. Talk amongst yourself. <laughs>
Right, so our spec second speaker is Kyra Woods. Did I pronounce your name right? That is Kyra. Kyra, Kyra Woods. Um, uh, Kyra is a clean energy organizer apprentice at the Sierra Club, a uh, sister organization with uh, Chicago 350 informally, but we have collaborated quite a bit. Um, Kyra currently coordinates the Ready for 100 campaign in Chicago, it's also a national campaign, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Recognizing the interdisciplinary nature of climate issue, Kyra works to strengthen existing partnerships and develop new ones across the city so that Chicago's clean energy transition will be centered upon values of solidarity, innovation, and equity. Awesome. <laughs> Can you mute the screen? Right here? Yes. Do you not do that? No, I don't, but I can All right. try. All right. Okay, so that everybody doesn't have to look at the computer, scan my hard my, my flash drive, I'm just going to kind of keep this going, and hopefully that'll catch up. But in the interest of time, I did want to um, go ahead and get started. Uh-oh, we may be getting somewhere. Um, again, my name is Kyra Woods. I am a Chicago native and returned volunteer of the Peace Corps. Very happy to be back in Chicago. Um, for this campaign, but also to simply be like, having the opportunity to simply talk to other folks about ways that you can get involved, ways that you can really make a difference in terms of environmental advocacy. Um, so how many of you guys have ever gone as a volunteer to table uh, on behalf of 350 or another organization you work for? Raise your hand. All right. How was that experience? You know, were some of you guys just, are all of you guys go-getters or was it ever challenging for folks? What makes it difficult? Getting a conversation started. Getting a conversation started. Why is that difficult sometimes? People have a lot of distractions when they're walking. They don't want to close them. Yeah, it's complicated. You know, there's so many factors. Tell me more. Well, I don't, you know, <laughs> start talking and then, um, do you talk about politics? Do you talk about economics? Do you talk about ecology? Absolutely, absolutely. And then you feel like you're talking too much and you've lost your audience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I definitely agree, but what's one of the most rewarding things about that opportunity? Reaching someone. Reaching somebody. And what does it mean to reach someone? You can change their mind. And why is that important? That's why you say it. <laughs> it also moves the ball forward. It moves the ball forward. Melissa, well, so what you say? To make progress. To make progress. Yeah. I would, I would almost, I'm not even sure if I know that's exactly why I table, but sometimes I table simply to plant the seed. In a single tabling opportunity, in a single flyering opportunity, in a single petitioning opportunity, you know, you may not change someone's mind, but you can get the ball rolling. You can get the conversation started, and you can just plant that seed so that they go home, they talk to a neighbor, they talk to a family member about what, you know, what on earth were you talking about? And maybe they should think a little bit more. Maybe they should take action. And so now that I'm back from the Peace Corps, um, I am talking to folks across Chicago about Chicago's clean energy transition. And what does that mean? What can that mean? And we're a Sierra Club framing this conversation around the Ready for 100 campaign, but what's beautiful is that you have the opportunity to meet organizations, civic leaders, and our neighbors and family and friends, wherever they are, to have this conversation so that they can click in, whether it's a financial argument, that fiscal argument that Larry mentioned, maybe it's a moral conversation as well, about why this clean energy ma uh, transition matters and why the time for it is now, and what can they do to get involved. So this is not a formal agenda, excuse me for the title, but it's more of an overview of some things that we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to just open briefly with this idea of keeping up the momentum. 
Um, what's already going on? I'd love to talk about a bit of the, the context within our state, the fine prairie state of Illinois, and the Windy City. What has already been happening here? What are you guys already doing about this conversation? Um, and then we'll talk a bit about the campaign in and of itself and uh, go beyond solar panels and wind turbines. The Ready for 100 campaign is not just simply about you know, putting more solar panels up and you know, buying up land or using farmland for you know, community solar or utility grade and sized um, panel or, or arrays, but also there are really serious issues of equity that we should be talking about. There are really explicit conversations that we need to be talking about when it comes to environmental justice or environmental injustices. There are things that are currently at play right now that we should be deliberately discussing so that we don't make the same transgressions, but simply in the name of clean energy. And then we'll wrap up with um, some feedback from you all. Ooh. That white screen is very bright, that blue. <laughs> 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 all right, so the state passed what many people know as FIJA. That is the Future Energy Jobs Act. By show of hands, how many of you guys have heard of FIJA? Awesome, very cool. All right, so our folks, raise your hand if you're excited about FIJA. Woo! Raise your hand if you don't know a thing about FIJA and you don't like, yeah, right? Two hands. <laughs> um, FIJA is, and then raise your hand also, like let's do the whole spectrum. Raise your hand if you also think there's room to grow with FIJA. Awesome. Very cool. So of those that raise their hand, what um, what's kind of lacking with FIJA? Or what, what would we like to see more from it? Ponder. I'm going to come to you in a moment, miss. For those who aren't as familiar, I'm going to just do a brief cursory look at FIJA. Um, I don't do tons of policy work as an organizer with Sierra Club, but what is beautiful about Sierra Club is that we do tabling and flyering and a host of other volunteering opportunities, pick up some seeds for you know Earth Day and go clean up a park and beach, but you also have folks that are willing to sue and like take legal action where legal action is necessary. And FIJA um, was, is actually a beautiful, it's, it's a piece of legislation that took a lot of hard work from a lot of different parties. Um, in that, it's a beautiful piece of policy, but I do agree with that last section of folks, there's some work to be done. Um, FIJA, so this is the first image you see when you go to the Future Energy Jobs Act website. They are saying, it is here, it is now in effect. It was signed into um, effect at the end of 2016, but actually went into effect last year in 2017. And so we really want to um, amplify the messages of increased and the expansion of energy efficiency programs of course, also, we will actually have more renewable energy on the grid. FIJA sometimes gets encapsulated in this idea of by 2025, and this is not the only thing in the bill, but by 2025, Illinois will reach 25% clean energy. The energy that we use in our state will be 25% clean renewable energy by 2025. Okay, that's that. <laughs> Top right, we're looking at job training. We're, there's, there was so much discussion about where these job training programs will be, who is eligible for these job training programs, and trying to ensure that traditionally marginalized groups um, be those within low to moderate income households or returning citizens or those aging out of the foster care system. We want to make sure that those particular populations have a chance to get trained and placed into jobs and frankly into careers within this new clean energy revolution. And then um, also we will, I won't actually dive into this, but the zero emission standard, um, I'm not sure if folks are really into nuclear and things like that, but that is one area possibly that FIJA can stand to grow, is um, some, some bolstering that happened for our nuclear plants here in, in Illinois. So of those of you guys that raised your hand and said FIJA has room to grow, FIJA 2.0 could use some improvements, what to you stands out? <coughs> Our portfolio standard. Our portfolio standard. Has to be increased. Okay, so for those in the room who may not even know what a portfolio is or what a, what its standard is, can you bring it down for us? Uh, what is it, by 2025, it's supposed to be 25%. Uh, basically, the next one should raise that to 
Absolutely. by a certain date. Cool. Um, and then do all the parts of the legislation and rule writing that will basically allow that to happen. Spot on there. Yes. So I have a question about the uh, how extensive the job training is. Sure. I mean, my impression where I heard it from somebody that it's really very small and it's kind of just starting up right now. And I'm not sure how much political will there is behind it, but as I say, I haven't <coughs> researched that directly. Yeah. Recently. So what do you say about that? I would say that there's room to grow. I appreciate that it is written. Um, in the law that it needs to exist and that it prioritizes communities that have been marginalized and continue to be marginalized. Um, I do know that some of those training programs have begun um, in terms of their initial classes. There, um, I, I, I believe that the groups that were involved in passing FIJA um, as well as some other entities. There's a lot of community feedback, I'll, I'll say this. There's a lot of community feedback that there needs to be a central place to get some of this information. Just there are, there are a variety of training programs that train for a variety of different types of jobs, right? Because this clean energy revolution is not just about getting a, you know solar panels installed on your house, right? How many of you guys have ever had a problem and you called a customer service center or you needed a, a manager for some type of concern, right? So there are different tiers and I think some of the training programs address that as well. Um, so yes, I don't have tons of details, but I would love to put you in contact with somebody who does if you want to delve into it further. All right. So this is not, too, this is, I believe on the resource page on the FIJA site. Um, I just wanted to take the quick screenshots so that you could see how, how the act has been just encapsulated. Job creation and stimulation. Enhancing Illinois to be poised as a great clean energy leader. Um, but we have got room to grow. And then, of course, preserving Illinois' low energy rates. How do we protect consumers? How do we protect businesses as well? So one element of consumer protection that is embedded into FIJA is that um, Consumer, there's a, a 25 cent per month cost cap. So you should not see an increase or a rate spike by a dollar, two dollars, or five dollars on your bill just because we're transitioning our type of economy, our energy economy, excuse me. And that's pretty important to consider, um, especially because there are a number of slightly predatory uh, practices going on in terms of uh, energy rates. Okay, so that was a bit about our prairie state. I did want to highlight the Clean Energy, uh, excuse me, the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. And in the interest of time, I will keep this moving, but the coalition is a statewide coalition that continues to meet to um, really discuss how we bolster the Jet 2.0. All right, are you guys ready for more clean energy in Chicago? Yes. That was a really lukewarm response, but I'll take your word for it. Um, I'm ready for 100, and what's cool about this particular campaign is that to date we have seen more than 60 cities across America commit to a clean energy transition for their city. And essentially that would mean that they would either purchase um, more clean energy or produce in their city more clean energy to meet their uh, needs. And so here in Chicago, Last year, Mary Emanuel actually made the commitment that by 2025, our municipal buildings and operations will be sourced by 100% clean energy. Great first start. We appreciate you, Mary Emanuel, if you're watching. And we want more. So um, why not? <laughs> so this is, this is actually just a brief, um, this is the cover from our case studies report from last year, highlighting some of our newest cities that have joined the Ready for 100 ranks. And this commitment that we're asking for is a beautiful blend of aspirational and prescriptive, and prescriptive in the sense that we want this to be community-led and community-informed. What types of communities are in most need? Back to the training programs, back to energy burden, what communities are experiencing unfair um, economic uh, burden, I guess, just based on how much they make and how much they spend on their utilities. Um, and what's really actually exciting about this is that Madison is on there. If Madison can do this, you know, let's actually bump up the standard for the Midwest 
and put Chicago on the map. This is not just a coastal conversation anymore. This needs to be something that we, as Chicago, can step up to say, hey, we can do this too. Um, we're not going to have tons of time to get into all these other things, but your questions and your participation has been great. Um, I did, I really liked this little um, cartoon because in step two, what he mentions in the caption is that there's some miracle that happens. And we have heard in so many other movements or transitions, particularly around um, clean, clean energy and, and, and moving away from fossil fuel, you know, maybe when we get there or this isn't the right time or, you know, this is the right time. It is happening. This is the moment. And it's, it doesn't take a miracle. It takes deliberate conversations. It takes deliberate efforts to include voices that have not been a part of this conversation. This is far beyond solar panels. This is beyond 350 and Sierra Club. This is ensuring that the stories of the environmental injustices that have taken place in Chicago are heard, learned about, and not done again. So we want to make sure as we move forward in this campaign, I will show you just one thing before I get kicked off stage. Um, this is our theory of movement, movement building for this particular campaign. We want to make sure that as we build this house, as we move forward, that we're truly prioritizing both the impact of communities, everybody, right, that will be impacted by either um, the transition from fossil fuels in a negative way or, you know, whose lands we are on when we're putting out more community uh, solar or solar arrays, as well as being very deliberate about the partners that we include in this conversation. After that, we can really talk about the values and, and who should be targeted in this conversation and how do we pull in other people in this conversation. Then we can consider our messaging and our tactics to really move the ball forward. So on that, I will end. I look forward to your questions um, later in the evening and uh, your take action fit for me will be that I have some Ready for 100 petition cards. We are collecting cards to send to our gracious mayor, if you're still watching, spoiler <laughs> alert. Um, still and we encourage you to uh, sign one of those before you leave today. All right, thanks guys. person who can't save anything on the desktop because it's a university. So there's a bit of transition, but I think Brent is going to be the fastest. Yes. <laughs> uh, Frank Burke is Vice President of Grid Engineering at Segura Engineering Solar Division. Yes? Okay, Segura International is at the forefront of new energy business models to power and empower the world with clean, reliable, and fairly priced energy using a commercially viable micro-utility model. Their aim is to provide underserved populations with a first-rate electrical utility service that is tailored to their needs. Frank has worked on solar projects in Haiti and Africa with Segura. He previously worked for SoCor Energy. We're so lucky to have. Cool. Um, so we're going to take a little bit of a left turn uh, and head briefly to Haiti. Uh, I think, uh, well, first of all, thank you for the, to DePaul and 350 for having me here um, today. And, um, and I think one of the questions, I think I was expecting the panelists to get asked questions, um, but I'm going to ask a question, I guess, back, which is, if we can do it in Haiti, why can't we do it in Chicago? Um, and, and so that's, that's what I'm building towards here. There's a spoiler. Um, uh, but yeah, so Segura International is, is, a, is a company that uh, has developed a smart metering and payment platform for micro utilities around the world. Um, our installations are currently in the northwest of Haiti, Mont Saint Nicolas, Jean Ravel, Presque Isle, and Bombardopolis. So four towns totaling about 20,000 people who get their power from us every day. Um, and 95% of the people who work in these towns are people who live in these towns and have been trained, um, in most cases without more than a middle school education, to do the work of, uh, of the electric grid and basically building it from scratch and maintaining it. I've gotten some text messages while I've been sitting here about uh, from our customers and our vendors um, who are operating the system right now. Um, I haven't always been doing this. Um, I used to do this. Um, and 
uh, working in the wind industry with a company called Nordex, uh, which is based here in Chicago for the North and South America operations since we merged with Axiona. Um, they have offices all over. I want to just point out that there are companies in Chicago, plenty of them, uh, that are doing renewable energy, and there's a lot of jobs in this area associated with that. After doing this, I started doing this. Um, SoCor Energy is one of the biggest solar developers here in Chicago, um, and I was the director of engineering there for a few years. Um, really believe that the transition um, to solar needs to happen in the facilities um, where we live and work. Um, and so making it possible, um, or this was on the roof of a Target um, store. Um, but the commercial and industrial energy access is, is really critical to that transition, not just to wind and solar abstractly, but to wind and solar in our local communities and our local economies. Um, and then sometimes I do this. Uh, this was last Monday. <laughs> um, we were we broke into the uh, Enbridge uh, Line 3 pipe yard in Minnesota because that's important too. Um, and a little bit of a side story for myself. I started my career as a consultant to the energy industry. And one of my first projects, as I literally showed up first day at work, um, and the first thing I had to work on was this kind of mess of papers that was redacted, you know, and I couldn't even, it's like alphabet soup, what was I even working on? But for some reason, I needed to, to bring 13 megawatts of power to northern Alberta, and I couldn't figure out why. And so my first weekend after work, I started Googling. And I realized this is 2008, um, before the words Keystone XL pipeline were like a big deal. Um, and recognizing, you know, as day one on the job, electrical engineer, that um, like all transitions, this one would need to be deliberate. We weren't just gonna plop down in business as usual and have it happen by accident. So even though there's cost factors and even though there's a lot of other factors um, that point towards this energy transition, it's not gonna happen on its own. And that's, I think, the point that's been made by the two former speakers. Um, so that was last Monday, and then on Saturday night, I was back at my university for my 10-year reunion, and I made a little side trip to the law school to interrupt the chancellor with the fossil free campaign, and we made sure he knew that the endowment still has not been divested from fossil fuels, um, in case he forgot. Um, and, and so did so all the alumni in the room and the donors. So uh, once again, there's, I don't know, where's the chancellor's office? They around. Um, but, but we should think about ways in which we bring this conversation forward. Um, and so for myself, I, um, this is a reflection of, you know, not just values, but also um, professional. I mean, as an engineer, I have a choice of what I work on. Um, and, uh, and that's important to me. So I consider myself a conscientious subjective to fossil fuels. Um, in the way that I might be a draft dodger in some other generation, but I, I think we need to we need to think about about what that means. Um, but this is what I do now. So this is my team in Jean Rebel. Um, good luck finding me in the picture. It looks like I'm Photoshop. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, that's that's the crew that uh, that built and maintains uh, electric service uh, for for one of the largest towns in the northwest of Haiti. Um, and, and I have so much confidence in, in these people and, and the work that they're doing. Um, I was down in Haiti from November until March, and I've been back for a few weeks. And it's fun. It's fun to watch the team do this work on their own. That's the plan. It's, it's, the organization is entirely Haitian-led and Haitian-staffed at the moment. Um, and I'll come back um, next month when we install our batteries and, and we have periodic projects. But um, this is a really important story. Um, to anyone who would say that, well, you're not going to be able to create jobs, for, you know, you're not going to be able to do that, you know. Um, these are people who aren't trying to get into our country, which, by the way, welcome if they want to, but these are people who aren't even trying to go to the capital city of their country. These are people who are staying in their own communities, where their families are, where they live and work, and able to provide that uh, for their neighbors. Um, and the other question I get a lot, so I'll just jump to Q&A already, is what if there's a hurricane? Well, it would be great anywhere that there's a hurricane for the exact skills necessary to rebuild to be right there at the time that it happens because as we've seen in Puerto Rico and in Haiti and in countless other places, uh, it takes us six months to get people there and then we start working. And the, the $8 uh, have, have not been used as effectively as we'd like um, in many of these cases. So this is the local workforce we're talking about in Haiti and I think um, it's not hard to imagine, for me at least, the similar efforts for the workforce here in Chicago. Um, and so how do we do it? Um, this is really quick. Is, is Lemon here? 
Yeah, okay, Lemma works with me. Lemma's on this team at Segura, um, and Lemma helped out tremendously on this slide, so this is how we do it. We've got a Segura smart meter. Um, with, this is on everybody's house. It's prepaid, you pay over your cell phone. That way the energy's on your account and your energy runs out, the lights go out, and we can track that through a couple of different tools. Um, but that's not, not a sales pitch. The point is, um, our availability um, last year was, bottom row there, 99.81%, which is comparable within a tenth of a percent to the US um, system availability. Um, so this is not only possible, it's happening. Um, this was the town of Bombardopolis. Um, we went from a Google map to a completely built grid in five weeks. It's a town of 8,000 people. Again, we did it with local people. At the peak of construction, we had about 80 people working for us. Um, steady state is about 40. Um, and then next month, I get to go down and install some batteries. And so basically, I think Larry mentioned batteries uh, are, are important, more so in microgrid settings than the large grid. But um, I know it's a little bit of an eye chart. It's also rainbow, which is nice. But you have your solar, your solar day in the top left, the load on the top right. In the US, there's a much well, first of all, x-axis is days of the year, y-axis is hours of the day. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, okay, good. So, in the U.S., you see a much more pronounced variation uh, over the course of the day, but in these grids, it's a lot of kind of cell phone charging and lights and, and just small usage of appliances like refrigeration. Um, so, there's less variability. But you can see the peak is actually in the evening around 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Um, but so the battery system can take some of that solar power from the daytime, the battery hits its maximum peak at the end of the solar day, and then the diesel generator goes to about nothing. So um, right now we're using about 30% um, solar, just solar and diesel cycling back and forth. With the battery, we jump from 30 to 88%, so it'll be 88% renewable by the, the time the battery installation is complete, so likely next month. And so what is the difference between 30 to 88%? That's not burning diesel. So um, taking, leaving it in the ground, um, which has been said. Um, so, and, and also, uh, it's not like we're sacrificing uh, like quality of life by doing that. Um, there's a huge boom uh, to the local entrepreneurship. Um, it, for fishing, you know, you, if you either, if you live in a place without electricity and you're somebody who fishes, then you can only catch as much fish as you can either eat or sell in a day. There's no point in catching an extra. So your work day is done at 7 a.m. Um, and and in, a, in a town with refrigeration, these folks can work longer hours, they can make more money, they ship food inland away from the coast, um, which is cool. That thing on the bottom right is a uh, UV water purification system. So people are getting clean drinking water rather than buying bottled water. They're, this guy actually bottles his own. But he uses the Segura electricity to make his own uh, clean water, which he sells in town. Um, so, and we're already ahead of the U.S. in terms of renewable energy penetration. So, um, good thing other people did this so I don't have to, um, but there's already more solar jobs uh, than oil and gas extraction and coal mining. Um, so there is a war on coal, it's called capitalism, um, and it's really not my fault, um, but I wish it was. Um, in terms of globalized cost of energy without subsidies, um, you know, the top half is renewable, the bottom half isn't, and cost parity is pretty much there. The problem with the way this is presented, although it's, the numbers are right on, the problem is this is for new investment, um, and nobody's building any new coal plants. So we're not competing against the cost of a new coal plant, we're competing against the cost of depreciated assets that are 50 years old and we're still winning. Um, and that's, I think it's important to just see that over time, of course, the trend lines are positive. Wind drops 66% in seven years, and solar drops 85% in seven years. This is, again, from Lazard, same source. So there's that. Um, the last thing I want to throw out, just as Kyra mentioned, the environmental justice is going to be a huge part of this here in the local context. If you push for 100% in Haiti, it's kind of shame on you, Chicago, for sneaking towards 5% or whatever, but we're, we're moving we're moving that forward. Don't accept arguments that say it's not feasible. Um, but in terms of environmental justice, I'm also a founding member of this group, the Social Justice Design Cooperative. Uh, and basically the principle here is that if folks need a lawyer but can't pay for it, they have a public defender. Um, right now, I don't know what's happening at the EPA, but there's some forces at play. Um, I think environmental justice communities should have a public defender as well. That's called 
uh, the Social Justice Design Cooperative. So this group is a bunch of engineers, architects, planners, and scientists. They want to help um, communities uh, basically put them in a position to control the future. Um, and so this, I just want to promote briefly an event. This Saturday, we're working with Paro, and we have been since July, doing a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests on the lead drinking water in Chicago. That news story blew up last week and over the weekend. So we'll be in Pilsen this weekend talking about lead water and filtration. So if anybody's interested in that, you're welcome to reach out. Um, if any of the presenters or anybody in the audience has um, an event uh, that they want to promote, please see me because I um, run our a blog at Paul um, Environmental Critique as well as uh, the, one of the 350 sites. Uh, it's very quickly, if there are any students here, there is a sign-up sheet outside. Um, make sure you sign up there if you get expect to get extra credit. Um, and have your right here. Um, no, 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 it's okay. You know. um, yeah, there is a rush, but you're good. Um, Matthew o Uber is a financial planning and analyst uh, associate, right? Associate, yes. Associate at Invenergy. Matthew, uh, do you still do financial analysis strategy? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Matthew performs long term financial strategy analysis for Invenergy's thermal international businesses. Invenergy develops, builds, owns, and operates clean power generation and energy storage facilities in North America, Latin America, Asia, and Europe. The company has developed more than 17,000 megawatts. Is that right? Yes. Closer to 19. 19,000 megawatts of utility scale, wind, solar, thermal, and energy storage projects. Matt has a passion for understanding the finance and policy mechanisms which drive clean energy and sustainability tech development in the U.S. and abroad. He is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame where he studied economics, anthropology, and German. Thank you very much, Matthew. I made the very helpful note to myself to make printouts to break. Um, I brought 10. So <laughs> it's so great to see everybody here. I think it's an amazing event, and I think it's so cool that the Paul is opening this up to the public. So I'm an industry guy. I work for a company called Invenergy LLC. I'm going to start this by saying, parentheses, these are my opinions. These aren't necessarily Invenergy's opinions. But we are a company based here uh, in Chicago, and we're on Wacker. My background is in finance, so that's what I'm going to talk about. They're even uh, showing us how, much it, it, how important it is to uh, divest on the invest side. So this is getting banks and investors to bring their money in and finance our renewable and clean energy projects. So I'll give you the shortest intro possible to renewable energy finance. Um, I had the really cool idea to show you an Excel model. I'm going to test your patience and still go with that. <laughs> <laughs> renewable energy finance is married very much with what's going on in Washington. We respond to the tax incentive programs and the benefits that we're able to leverage that are determined by policy. So I'll touch on tax reform, um, what went down in January, and what it means for the industry from our perspective. And then I'm going to shift into some industry trends um, in the short term, uh, blow it all the way out to a global outlook. And then for anybody here in this audience uh, who is a student, especially, or somebody who's not in the industry but looking to get into it, I'll touch a little on how I got into the industry and what I think is some good advice for people in that position. So again, I'm Matt, I studied at Notre Dame. I did a semester abroad in Berlin, saw Germany's energy transition firsthand, saw how much the US was behind. That was a wake up call for me. I also did research in Mexico, and that was where I learned how much environmentalism speaks to me. I swam with sharks for a week and saw firsthand the effects of climate change in coral reef die off. Uh, my first job out of college working with the German American Chamber of Commerce again promoting the benefits of sustainability tech and how far Germany has gone ahead. And yeah, now I work with Invenergy. Just to put uh, a number on my credibility, I have been on the lead team for $400 million worth of renewable energy projects, and that's in uh, new generation and equipment purchasing. And a little bit about a company that I work with, Invenergy, is the largest privately held clean energy provider in North America. Got 122 uh, projects and over $19,000 uh, megawatts of generation. And we do 
the whole gamut of developing projects. We have in-house engineering and construction teams, finance teams, and then we do our own O and M and have operations out of Chicago. I like the fact that finance falls right in the middle because I do see it as the convergence of all of these different teams for all the developing you do and how um, well you can engineer your project. If you can't get it financed, if you can't get the investment there, it's not going to get to operation. So broadly speaking, whenever you pro uh, do project finance, when you finance a project, there are two sources that you're trying to access. Debt is the traditional one. That's um, the clear and present example is a mortgage. It's just you take out a loan from a bank and pay it back over time with an amortization schedule. Equity is a direct investment. There, um, you give ownership of the project to another party. And while there are two big ones, in energy project finance, there are two and a half. And the subcategory for equity is called tax equity. And this is the strategic allocation of renewable energy credits. And this is the way we leverage all of these tax incentive programs. So there are two major tax incentive programs that are um, in play here. One is the investment tax credit, and one is the production tax credit. Um, you'll hear ITC and PTC dropped all the time. These are one-to-one -one tax credits that um, are as, as good as money. Um, a dollar in a tax credit is as good as a dollar in revenue. And there's also a third aspect. Um, renewable energy projects are able to use accelerated depreciation to get um, tax favorability. After you find out, uh, set up your project to leverage these incentives, the next step is to establish your optic. And for the longest time, we would build a project, and our optaker was a utility. They would sign a long-term power purchase agreement, also called a PPA. And for 20 years, 35 years, you would have an established cash flow. The newer trends are commercial industrial investors, CNI investors. This could be Microsoft says we have a data center and we want it to be um, powered with solar. This is um, these are the big players now, more so than traditional utilities. They're going to be interested in what you might call a VTPA, which is a virtual power uh, power purchase agreement. And this is saying we're going to build a solar plant in a field. Your production facility might be 100 miles away, but you'll purchase power at an agreement agreed price that we've established, and the market will settle the contract for differences. From our perspective, once the power purchase agreement is ended, we'll also do merchant pricing. This is just we sell the energy to the market. Once you've got your established off taker, you press your project to meet returns and then go out and put it on the grid. So when you talk about the PTC, I think it's really helpful to look at the way the investors are seeing it. Because it's easy to say it as a piece of policy but this is the nuts and bolts of it, really. So this is just something I've put together. The numbers are fake, but the methodology is um, pretty true to form. So we've got a wind project um, right at the ball, so I called it Blue Demon. <laughs> it's a 40 megawatt, or 48 turbine project. Those turbines are producing um, 3.4 megawatts. So the capacity project is 136. Take that at hours per year, and you get your megawatt hours per year about 478,000. So we're just looking at it over the course of five years, and we say this is our production for all five years. Usually you might factor in degradation, especially in the case of solar. I'm taking liberty here. We'll say we signed a PPA for three years. So for three years, we have contracted um, with an off-taker to say we have a set price. Um, no matter what the market does, no matter where the price goes, for three years, this is what you're paying and this is what we're getting. I'm saying the PPA is going to price so we get a favorable return at $50. So that price is locked in for three years. And then at the same time, the market is moving. So the market could start at $40 in 2019, and then it could go favorable. Typically, um, uh, when you get a commercial analytics report, you have um, market, our engine prices going up in general at the market. Which may not be true to form, we typically have that, but again, taking a liberty. For the first three years, you have your fixed revenue, then you have your merchant revenue. Once that falls off, this is called the merchant tail. Um, and then this is your cash flow, or your revenue at least. Once you have your revenue, you need to, to get your cash flow, you need to go revenue less your expenses. So you say this is your 
operating expenses is what your developers and your engineers are telling you it will cost to run the plant. Again, this is in, I'm um, sorry, in parentheses, this is in thousands of US dollars, so it takes four million to run the plant in the first year. And then this is where it gets interesting. This is um, the BPA as it stands right now. The current price in this year is about 2.4 cents um, per kilowatt of generation, and then um, it does move for inflation. So we still have to move up a little. Once you get um, your revenue from above, you take the dollar off X. This is your earnings for any sort of tax. And again, this is all tax benefits. You're leveraging your tax um, incentives. The first one I mentioned was accelerated depreciation. We said it costs 200 million to build this plant. When you have accelerated depreciation, you can actually drive the cost of that um, asset so low that it becomes a negative. And when you go to pay a tax on a negative, um, if you've ever done your taxes, this is what you call a tax return. So the corporate tax right now is 21% after tax reform. In those first years, because you have negative taxable income, you actually generate positive tax benefits as an inflow. And then after that is uh, fully depreciated, it goes to becoming a tax liability again. Okay, so putting that all together, <laughs> you have your pre-tax cash flow, which is your um, earnings, your EBITDA. You are at first generating positive tax benefits because of your accelerated depreciation, but then you're paying taxes. So you get an after-tax cash flow, and then the PTC comes in. So this is, again, it's the same thing. You have your generation. Um, we said it was 471 megawatts per year. And then we said for each kilowatt, we're generating 2.5 cents. That value per year is here, and it just drops in one for one. You count it as a revenue on your cash flow. So your after-tax cash flow here, you have the first-year investment, and then you can see when you're taking these tax advantages into account, you're already generating revenue. <laughs> <Enough of that. laughs> really, that's done in reverse because you price to a return that's attractive to an optaker, and then um, you direct your price. You don't set the price in first, but that's just logistics. Now, the historical implications of the PTC are important to consider. It was a bipartisan initiative. And the scale down for the, both of these credits has been established by law. Right now, you get uh, if the project is in place before 2000 or commences in construction before 2017 for solar, you get 30% direct refund on your investment. That's the investment tax credit, and that's upfront the cost of the project. 30% you get back. The production tax credit is more used for wind, and that is again um, for every kilowatt hour you produce, you get 2.5 cents. The production tax credit is in a step down period already, and the cliff was the end of last year when you could claim 100% PTC. Now it's going down, and by 2020, it'll be completely gone as the legislation stands currently. So, what happened in January? The Tax Cut and Jobs Act was passed and signed into law. Significantly, the established step down period for the PTC and the ITC remain unchanged, which was huge. This was something that the industry was very worried about. From a finance perspective, we didn't know how to price models. We didn't know how to prove the cash flows of the projects. Um, and we had to do a lot of sensitivity analysis to make sure we could still sit in front of investors and make our case. Bonus depreciation changed to 100%. So instead of doing over, uh, it's, it's five years actually for wind projects and solar projects. You could do 100% depreciation in the first year, which just front loads that benefit, but the extended makers is still in effect. The corporate tax rate is the most significant piece for tax equity. Because the tax um, income tax obligation for corporations decreased from 35 to 21 to 21 percent with no expiration date, their appetite of these corporations for tax equity decreased. And that makes sense. If you're leveraging tax benefits to decrease your tax burden, they're not as uh, attractive if you don't have a large tax burden. And the result has been the market has just shifted to the other side of those two methodologies. Instead of pursuing tax equity as much, traditional debt financing is um, being used just as uh, even more frequently 
and the market is big enough to accommodate that. So really, in retrospect, the tax reform that was passed in January was the best worst case scenario. Everybody was really afraid that it was going to change and disrupt things, but right now the industry is just in a holding pattern. We're still pricing our projects, we're still putting renewable energy on the grid, and there's optimism among the developers in the industry that we can overcome any type of reform that faces us. I don't know how I'm on time. Uh, okay. About one minute. About one minute. Awesome. So I just want to make a comment also on solar tariff because this is extremely um, topical. 30% uh, uh, solar tariff was imposed on solar imports. That is going to decrease up to 15% by 2021. But because of that is a percentage-based um, tariff instead of a flat dollar, it's honestly not so big when you're talking about utility scale because the price of technology is decreasing on its own, um, kind of on par with that. A direct result of the tariff that's been interesting to me is Jinko Solar, which is the largest or one of the largest Chinese solar manufacturers, panel manufacturers, is opening a production facility in Florida. Um, they said originally it was going to be like 800 U.S. citizens employed, um, producing so many panels per year. That's been scaled down. It's now about 200 jobs supported, but the tariff works. I, I don't know. I'm kind of uh, jury's out on that one. But it did bring production to the U.S., created some U.S. jobs, and the greater impact of the tariff seems to be less on the utility side and more on the distributed generation space because it is going to be a price increase that's passed through to consumers. People try to put solar panels on their roof. I'll talk about some global trends. I'll skip the industry trends because I think Larry did a good job with those. Um, I do a lot of foreign stuff um, all over the world. The big risks you have when you look at it, instead of, say, a city like Chicago and a um, city somewhere else in the world, you do have foreign exchange risk as currencies move up and down. Ease of doing business is going to be variable. Uh, you have to worry about the credit rating of the government. You have to be sure you can enforce laws and the contracts will be honored. And you have to um, pick places that have good economic stability. One of the most interesting areas to invent energy is Latin America. We have a regional office in Mexico City that just opened last year. We have um, projects in Uruguay. Uruguay is a very interesting country in general, 95% renewable energy. So that market's kind of been, it's been a success story for renewable energy. And we have two projects there, a solar farm and a wind farm. Europe is saturated. There's, I mean, we know how far ahead they are. It's kind of, uh, time to close shop on Europe. And we sold earlier this year our uh, Scottish wind farm called Borgar, and we're looking to get out of our Polish positions. Japan is very interesting. I work with Japan very frequently. Um, I adore working with the, the Tokyo office. They call me Matson, which I think is fun. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll close on Japan because I know I'm, I'm pushing Japan, but the top yellow dot is a solar project called Queens. And Queens is built in a prefecture called Fukushima, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. In 2012, um, Japan in, uh, implemented a feed-in tariff in direct result to a 180 in public opinion, rightfully so, on nuclear energy after the triple meltdown of Fukushima Daiichi. And I think it's a very, it's a very cool thing to say that we have um, a foot in the next phase of that recovery. And then, yeah, the U.S. is where we're big. Uh, goes without saying, that's most of our wind generation is in the central part of the states where the resource is the highest. And then we try to do solar on the coast where that resource is higher also. Uh, so yeah, I'll just end on my, my note to people looking to get into the industry. The first put, step I put is show up. And you guys being here don't need this advice. But it's very easy to decide you want to go home instead after your long day at work. Go to events, show up, get in front of people, and in my case, I bumped into my then and future manager um, at a networking event much like this one, uh, at Coalition Energy on Michigan Avenue, uh, who interestingly was a German woman. And because I've been in Berlin, was able to talk with her about it. So you need to know that the steps you take are gonna line up as long as you show up and are able to look back and see how it all came together.
and find a mentor. I had uh, the very great privilege of working with an excellent manager when I first started, and he's someone I still routinely meet with like, uh, every two months or so to talk. And if you're on the other end of that, be a mentor. That um, can't be overstated how much of a difference it makes in somebody's life if they're just trying to get into an industry that they're passionate about. If you're curious and are looking to break in the industry, we have internship opportunities, and I'd love to tell you about it if you come find me later. Thanks. All right, so if I can invite our panelists to the front of the room, and I stole somebody's water. <laughs> Where did we get one of those from? Um, any, anyone's free to leave. We do have the room until 8.30. I'm sorry for the time overrun. It's mostly my fault. Um, but uh, we're just so honored to hear from these guys. So I decided to put your hands if you can stay for the Q&A. That's fine. Um, there are flyers for this event. So if you, uh, is it right if people get in touch with you? Yeah, are they sure. told me you're all wrong. Right. LinkedIn or whatever. So if you want to ask questions, you can do that another time. But uh, let's go ahead if you need a mic. Uh, so the AV people just said to keep the mic in front for feedback. But if you want to use the mic, come to the front of the room. Okay? Uh, go ahead. Um, about the Future Energy Jobs Act, <clears throat> the Future Energy Jobs Act included $2.3 billion bailout for nuclear plants that were no longer profitable. And uh, people have noticed already that their electricity bill is going up. And um, the Illinois Manufacturers Association was against the passage of FIJA. Um, and I wonder if uh, Ms. Wood understands the position of the anti-nuclear, the national anti-nuclear stance of Sierra Club that um, now the Sierra Club has taken a national stance against the continuation of nuclear power. And um, the comment that was made um, that we need to expand nuclear power because it's, it's uh, carbon free is completely false. Nuclear power is not only not carbon free, but it's also a very dirty source of energy that keeps on giving for like 10,000 years of pollution. So uh, I, I feel that there was um, an um, error in saying that the Sierra Club stands in favor of continued nuclear power. Uh, I think that, that there's been a policy change there or a new policy that they are against the continuation of nuclear power. I I like to, because I we have so little like, time, we have to get like to that short. clarified. Okay. Okay. That's Sorry, can I respond? Yeah. Okay. Um, so very valid point, and I, mis I apologize if I was misunderstood or misspoke. Um, that is not the stance I was taking. You're absolutely correct. That is not the stance of the Sierra Club, and not my personal stance either. We are not suggesting that we expand nuclear energy and and nuclear energy production in our state. Um, my comment was intended to be heard as. That is what's in that bill. Um, I think particularly when you're talking about policy, there is a great need for compromise. And it is, to this day, a point that the Sierra Club understands is not ideal. But in order to take advantage of a particular political window and the, the progress that was being made, the things, the other positive things that were in that bill, um, that was something that we did support, um, you know, the, the totality of the bill. And as I also mentioned, there are still um, conversations around what this next iteration of our energy economy in our state is. So you're absolutely right. That is not, I, I apologize if I was misheard or misspoke, but that's not the stance that I was saying Sierra Club makes for myself. 
Uh, sorry, Melissa's moderating. I should have made that. Go ahead. So we heard that Chicago is doing a whole bunch of stuff, and we're we're doing things. In, uh, excuse me, where we at? Can hit it, of course. Um, and we're going for 100 percent, even though 25 percent is right now the goal a little bit. Um, and we hear that it can be financed. But why are we aiming so low and how come nothing is moving? Why is the world, rest of the world passing the United States? Who's the, the big person we're beating right now? Is it the culture, or politics, or economy? What are we fighting against? I, I think I can answer a little bit of that. Um, I've been doing research on the IPAA, which is the uh, Internet or the uh, Petroleum Association of America, Independent Petroleum Association of America. Um, and they really do have a sort of astroturf turf campaign where they are trying to beat back divestment movements across the country, where they actually hire consulting firms who sort of create these astroturf campaigns in order to try to convince people that fossil fuels are still the future and that we still need to invest in them and we still need to use them to create energy, to fuel our cars. Uh, and this is a, it's a very, it is a very active campaign that they have. I mean, where they even call people up and do uh, push polls to, especially people who are pensioners, and to, to scare them to think that, hey, if, if cities divest from fossil fuels, they will, their pensions are gonna be less than what they are, or what they're going, what they're promised. So that's one aspect where the fossil fuel industry is fighting. The other one is because they can basically buy politicians. The Koch brothers basically can buy politicians, and so those headwinds are what we're fighting against on a constant, daily basis. Is trying to get them to under get politicians to understand why uh, a switch to renewable energy is so important and why it must be done. And the fact that the technology is here. I mean, these gentlemen, you know, have proven it. Kyra has done a presentation on, on it. I've done the research on, on where the e economics are going. And so it's possible. It's just, it's kind of come down to political will and getting the American public to understand that doing a renewable energy is possible and it can be done faster than what everybody thinks. I mean, if, if, just to follow on that, I mean, I think if you took anything away from certainly my remarks, um, is that there isn't a reason why this can't happen. Um, the reason that we're left with is lack of political will, as, as Larry mentioned. Um, and I think we see that from top to bottom. We see that from the U.S.'s role in international climate agreements. We see that in the U.S.'s role of never having an energy policy that deals with generation sources. But we have the tax policy, which was wonderfully illustrated, but other countries don't actually use a tax policy as their energy policy. They have an energy policy. In many cases, an energy policy derived directly from their treaties and international climate agreements, which this country chooses not to participate in. So I think what we might say is that, uh, that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I think that's incumbent upon us, as I've mentioned, um, sometimes to put our bodies on the other side of the fence but to do what's necessary to make our democracy behave like a democracy. You were trying to collect my thoughts. And we're talking about how to convey information about renewable energy and sustainability, and you were discussing how we don't politically influence how politicians are bought and consulting firms are hired, and you did the research. And you have this information put out to us. Well, you don't really need to convince us that sustainability is great energy is fantastic. You cannot educate the blindfully ignorant individuals in this country. You, know, you were in Berlin, and I, I heard stories about four years ago. They had signs in the streets that tell you how fast you need to go to make the lights so you don't have to slow down and you can serve energy. That was in the 70s in Europe, and we're still not even close to that. So, my philosophy is to educate younger generations and individuals who are willing to obtain and accept this knowledge, which they can then promote to their organization, their township. I mean, forget about politicians. That, that's, that's, in my opinion, is almost impossible. But it is possible. I'm not going to say it's impossible. But how do you, our panel, think we 
can educate individuals who are growing and want to learn and have the passion to promote and get the sample in. Um, I think one of the most important elements of holding community conversations or just talking with a neighbor is better understanding where your neighbor is coming from. I think what's so challenging sometimes and what has been a faux pas within some organizations or in certain cities is when we simply want to go out and educate and just talk at people and say, you should believe this. This is the way things should go. I think there, I'm not saying that education is not important and that community education is a necessary community engagement, but I think you do have to take the time to better understand why your audience wants to be a part of this conversation or what's really in it for them. Why, what is its relevance? If you can't actually connect on this, five days may go by, yes, silver cycle, but a month later, what's the point, right? Um, especially if it's not reinforced. So, it, and from a, a, a variety of avenues, right? So, personally, um, I think that that's most important. I think that model, that visual of starting with engaging impacted communities and really being deliberate about the partners that you engage, that's why that's so important. So that when you do get to a strategy or a tactic around community engagement and outreach, you know that your messaging is actually going to resonate with your audience and you're not just spewing rhetoric, not rhetoric, I think it's important, you know, but, um, you know, that you're, you're actually saying words that are meaningful to people. Um, and so I think one thing that is particularly meaning to people is the dollar. People want to know how to save money or if they'll even save money, right? In some ways, potentially this isn't going to make a huge dip in people's bills. And, you know, if that's going to be the case, shouldn't maybe lead with that, you know, because if they don't see an immediate dip the month, the next month, you may lose somebody there, but you should be transparent and take time. Building relationships take time, right? Um, and so being, I think Matt, you said show up. The importance of showing up in spaces and listening is important before you simply go around saying, this is what needs to happen. I would just want to add one last thing to that, is that part of it is this aspect of you go out and you listen, but it's also just, it's a constant effort. You know, we've been doing this for like the last four years, and it's, it's, going, to, it's going to festivals, meeting people there, and listening to what they have to say, but also saying, this is why we think it's worthwhile to do things. Um, and just being willing to reach out to people. I always think of it, this, this, act, this action that we do, it's three, three yards in a cloud of dust. You know, you go to the huddle, they call the play, run the play, and you run three yards, you get tackled, and you get up, do it all over again. And that's sort of how you continue to reach out to people is by being willing to make the effort and being willing to go to the, where they live and listen to them while also talking to them about what you think, uh, you know, where the world is going. I have to comment on that too, but it's, but it's also, there's also a huge onus on the big guys, not just individual people, but big guys need to show corporate social responsibility, absolutely. And it's something that I'm proud to say I work in the energy because we do. We, don't just put up winter turbines on a farmland and then leave. We go back year after year, um, pass the tax proceeds back to the community, invest in volunteer fire programs, do events in the community, and go into the schools and talk to them year after year. It's it's a there's a persistency that's required. I'll bring back. Uh, I was going to ask specifically about Chicago, so I guess this question is from here. Um, what is the biggest area of improvement? Because kind of Tyra's point, a lot of this is to do with it's such a big issue, it's very difficult to cover everything, but the starting point. And as a city, you know, we're here in Chicago, what would you guys say is the most important and the most necessary thing for us to reduce our carbon footprint against to a more reduced city this morning? It's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe some but I think they might be more with just the, what we can do energy-wise. Energy -wise, I think everything, every step we can take to further smart grid um, progress should be taken. I particularly like B2G technology, I think it's underutilized, but the idea that we could have electric cars assist in load balancing as they plug into the grid. When people are parked at work, that's, that's such a huge 
battery capacity is just sitting there in the streets. If people who come and commute into the city are able to use their car batteries to assist in um, you know, stopping excess generation, serving it, and then putting it back into the grid as they go along. So the yeah. cars become part of the grid. Yeah, the, they the technology's they not store, there. But, you know, they store they could store energy on the grid or assist in um, making sure it doesn't spike. Exactly. Yeah. And there are groups in Chicago that are involved in that space. That's an idea. Yeah, I would say uh, in addition to that, I mean, so anything we do to electrify the transportation fleet is kind of a double dividend because then everything we do to uh, make the grid more renewable also makes transportation fleet more renewable and liquid fuels are, are a much bigger and growing part of, uh, of, of emissions. The other thing I would say is with the Future Energy Jobs Act, um, it would have been nice to see more attention paid to interconnection requirements and, and other regulatory hurdles that interfere with uh, adoption of renewable energy, specifically at the small residential scale. Um, one thing I, I would like to kind of challenge uh, on the, the impact of the of the U.S. picking the trade war with China over solar panels, um, which you know, throwing a, a, a larger tariff on imported panels um, is is not working and will not work. There's 250,000 jobs in the solar industry. There's potentially 800 coming into 800 versus 250,000. Um, the people, the, the solar jobs in this country are not manufacturing solar panels. If we wanted to be doing that, 10 years ago would have been the time. Uh, we've missed the boat on, on solar manufacturing and wrapping up facilities like that at this point is self-defeating. Um, it would be nice, but that's not the world that we live in. And so for every one person in this country making solar panels, there's probably over 100 installing them, especially at local scale. And so what we need for the state of Illinois is streamlined solar and other on-site renewable interconnection standards so that the renewable energy that we are buying to fulfill these requirements is energy that's produced in the state, installed by Illinois residents, local workers, especially in most impacted communities, and not stuff that blows in from Kansas on a transmission line, um, which is, which is there's nothing wrong with that. More renewable energy is what we want. But in other states that I've worked in, in the previous jobs that I mentioned, after the portfolio standard goes through, there's still plenty of ways for regulators and utilities to interfere with safe, timely, reliable interconnection through loopholes and, and artificial barriers, like what we've seen in Illinois for the past five years. Uh, with the funds for the renewable portfolio for the renewable energy standard not being allowed to be released by the by the state government until this law was passed. So Frank, like along those similar lines, how did that project in Indiana off the ground? Like how can we get projects like that off the ground here in Chicago? Uh, I don't think there's ever going to be a project in Chicago where I get to build the grid from scratch uh, because that would require all of you to cut your cords to <laughs> Comet. Um, so I would rather than rather than try to duplicate my project here, I'd say we learn from that project. And, and especially, if, if anything can happen in Northwest Haiti, it could easily happen in Chicago. I, I, I would say my point tonight should be taken as just kind of cutting through the BS and the excuses that we hear from our opponents time and time again. Yeah, um, thank you, Matt, for the presentation on the financing um, of renewable energy. But my question is, uh, who are your clients? What are the big companies? Are they governments or private industry? And also, which are the major uh, financial institutions? Because we can apply a lot of pressure if we know who these uh, major players are. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. The, as I mentioned, the long-standing um, industry standard which we produce generation and the utilities are up there. Now more and more private companies are interested in getting into that space. So we just completed a sale of a solar farm to Berkshire Hathaway Group. Um, Sorry, so, as mentioned earlier this week, we completed the sale of uh, solar farm uh, to Berkshire Hathaway, the real estate investment group that Warren Buffett heads. Um, we've fielded a response, a request for proposal from groups like Microsoft. Um, technology companies are definitely leading the way from the CNI side. Um, and then our largest banks, you mentioned um, the financial institutions, and it's it, yeah, sure, it's good to call them out because they deserve to be recognized if they're investing in a responsible way. Um, some of our larger partners are uh, Mitsubishi UFG, um, Prudential, I'm just thinking back to those, GE um, has a financing arm, GE Energy Financial Services, that is one of our strongest partners. Santander has been involved in our projects. Uh, I 
I can send you more information if you are uh, interested. But there are also um, banks I know that are recognized as being coal banks. And these are banks that are financing and bank rolling fossil fuel development. Yeah. Um, there was a comment earlier about uh, politicians are bought, right? And a lot of that stems from citizens united trying to free up corporate money. Um, so over the past few years in elections, we've seen that it's got more Republican pro business as opposed to pro society um, type economics. But I wanted to push back a little bit and say, I don't know how politically involved you are in the work that you do, but with the sort of sad circus that we've seen in the past 18 months or so um, in DC, do you not see maybe a little bit of a change coming from the grassroots and on the political spectrum? Sure, I do. Um, most of our work that we've been doing is with, at the city level, meeting with aldermen and city treasurer, trying to get meeting with Ron, that's really not easy. Um, so most of our work has been done at the city level and we've found a good response from from Alderman in, in many ways, um, and you know, so most of our work has been done in that 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 level. Um, when it comes to the point of you know, state and, and federal policy, that's where a lot of that fossil fuel money goes into to try to prevent you know, uh, better tax legislation, better uh, subsidies being created uh, to basically incentivize these installations. Um, so when politicians are able to take basically or fossil fuel companies are able to put unlimited funds in, in, you know, they can even just do it dark money where they don't have to say who they're giving it to or where it's going to or who's accepting it. Um, they can have a lot of influence over our politics. We all know that you, you mentioned Citizens United and fortunately, I mean, you're going to either have to Take you know elect people who will be willing to put someone on the Supreme Court who's willing to overturn that, or we're going to have to pass a constitutional amendment. Those are big lifts, but in order for us to do what we actually need to do, some of this is going to have to come from the you know politics of it of getting mass movements together to demand that our politicians not listen to them and listen to regular folks who understand the, the problems of climate change. Just, yeah, we should have some responses on that one. Go ahead. I actually um, was still abroad uh, serving with the Peace Corps during the election, and though really depressing to like watch it all unfold in like the media circuits leading up to his campaign and everything, him being Donald Trump, um, it was very interesting. Also watching the like the. the Backlash isn't the, the term I want to use, but like you said, are we going to see this reverse action happen? Yeah, and I would even use that sensitively because I'm not sure that everybody is actually getting it, but there are so many people that just wanted to go left and he said go right. Um, and so that was really interesting because I think it opened this window for that type of community education, that type of casual engagement, that, that bold nature from some politicians to say, we don't believe in he doesn't know what he's saying, or we don't believe that, and so let's not, why not listen to something else? Why not consider all these other things? So whether it's um, Sierra Club, before some mayors make a commitment to completely go 100%, um, there's a, a, another pledge that some mayors are taking to just explore some ideas. And so you saw mayors and governors and just people popping up in other community and civic leaders, just, just taking a chance and like actually listening to comments around either or, or arguments around clean energy transitions for their localities. So I do think that we have seen some things change. We saw that even in our global, um, during the primary and in, in leading up the campaigns leading up to uh, March's election as well. So I'm hopeful that we'll see some of that here in Illinois. Okay, so for the sake of time, since I had it going till 8 and it's already 8.17, we are going to wrap it up, but I just want to thank Matthew, Kyra, Frank, and Larry for sharing their time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Email us at 3
Oh, and if you want to tweet on our table, you can tweet. You got an action. Get involved now. Tweet the mayor. Bye.